everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Justin from Empire Flippers. Now, folks, we've been chatting, so we're already good friends. But before I talk about Empire Flippers, I'm going to get introduce you. Justin, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give him a little background. Hey, Gabriel. My name is Justin Cook. I'm a co-founder and partner at a company called Empire Flippers, where we help people buy, sell, and invest in websites and online businesses. So, Justin, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Let's start from the beginning. How how did you get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I started a real estate company uh, with my current business partner, but this is before we got into what we're doing now. And uh, this is during the kind of like the mortgage boom, right? 2004, 2005, 2006, and things were going quite well. Um, we started working for a broker and then kind of went off and started brokering our own deals until the financial crisis hit. And we failed miserably, our business failed, and we had to go get jobs. So we ultimately ended up working for like a mid-level SEO company, kind of like, you know, you know managers, right? Mid-level managers of this mid-level SEO company. And did a couple of years of that and we realized, you know, we miss entrepreneurship. We miss kind of like, you know, wearing all the hats and being, you know, an entrepreneur. And so we convinced our employers to let us start a company in the Philippines to become service providers for our employers. So we moved to the Philippines in 2010 to set up an outsourcing company for our previous employers. That lasted about a year. And then they started cutting back significantly on us as they started feeling the financial pain. So again, we were in a business that was basically paying the bills, but barely. And we're living in the Philippines going, what the hell are we going to do? And that's when we tried out a few things. I mean, so this is like a, you know, win, fail, get a little further, fail again. And then we came across the idea of creating niche websites monetized with something called Google AdSense, where people can make money based on display advertisements. So we started building these sites out of the Philippines in our office. We had a team of people doing it, and we built an audience of people that wanted to buy these small niche websites. So that's kind of how we got into the online website business game. And you know, folks, this is the interesting part about this is, um, you know, folks that have a website, if, if you build an audience, right, you built a brand, right, you built a value. Uh, and, and the thing about it is, uh, folks like Justin, right, they can they can go in and they'll purchase your website, and they'll put little things that make it better, bring more SEO, bring more volume, bring more traffic, and then they go and sell it. Yeah. Well, that's the that's the interesting thing, the disconnect between buyers and sellers, right? So, you know, we started off building our own kind of sites. There were small sites making a hundred bucks a month and people were buying for like $1,500, $2,000. They started getting bigger and bigger. Eventually we started letting other people sell their websites with us. And it went from, you know, selling for $2,000 to 20 to 200 to now we sell anything between 50,000 to, I think our largest deal was 13 million. So wow. we've done like kind of the, the end story, kind of where we ended up, we've done like just under $500 million in total online business sales over 2,200 or so transactions. Um, but this all started off with my business partner and I in a small townhouse in the Philippines, just hustling. And, you know, we had a small team of people in an office in the Philippines, him and I lived together in a townhouse and we just started hustling. Now we have a team of, you know, 40 something people around the world. Um, so that's kind of how it started. But what's interesting about buying and selling businesses is there's always a disconnect, right? Like the buyer is kind of skeptical, like why is the seller selling it? The seller is like, in many cases, they you know they think it's maxed out. They can't get any more value. Or they squeeze the, the the grape for as much as it's worth, or they have you know kind of terrible personal situation where they're getting divorced, or their business partner and them are having issues or whatever, um, or they see kind of they think that you know the future isn't looking good for the industry, and then the buyers, some some of them are skeptical, but those aren't the people that buy. The ones that do look at a business and say they're missing the boat on this. Like, you know, the seller's like, I got this up to $10,000 a month in profit. That's as good as it's gonna get. And you got the buyer that says, I don't get out of bed for anything under $10,000 of profit. This is kind of like a flyer for me. It's a small one. And they've done nothing on Facebook ads. They don't have any of the short form video content. I can crush it with my TikTok reels, Facebook reel strategy or whatever. And they're not doing any of that. So they buy it thinking, wow, I got a, I got a steal from this seller and the seller's going, you know, I pull one over on the buyer. And that's kind of like how businesses like ours are in business because we can kind of show, you know, here are the listings, here are the ones that are available, here are the ones that are the best fit for you. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's so impressive, you know, like kind of having that insight to kind of look at those things and then also look at the operational support that's kind of needed and the technical support that's needed just to add a little bit more value. Because again, at the end of the day, it's it. 
it's you're you're essentially finding the value that that the consumer finds valuable right to make them come back to this thing to purchase this item again and again right now but yeah. now justin you didn't start out successful in fact the one of the things you mentioned was that your first failure right so could you share a personal story of your entrepreneurial failures and setbacks and how your entrepreneurship and your own personal journey how have you used that failure to go and to succeed yeah, here's a good example. I think, you know, we were in the Philippines, as I mentioned, with our outsourcing company, and it was struggling in that, you know, we'd have a client leave that had like four employees of ours. They were hired, had hired four of our employees. We'd hire a new client that needed three, right? So we're like, okay, or we're net loss of one, and then we gain two, and then we lose two. And it was just really just kind of surviving. And it got to the point where it declined a little bit even further. And we had this office in the Philippines, and this is 2010, 2011. And, you know, we're living in the Philippines, right? Just we're able to pay the bills, but not by a ton. And we got to the point where we didn't think we we're going to be able to pay the internet, lights, rent, on everything on the office. And so we, we had the tough decision to basically close down our office. And, you know, all this remote work and stuff wasn't really a thing then. And we were like, oh, my God, if we're closing this office, we're here in the Philippines, we're losers. Like this isn't a real company anymore. You know what I mean? So there's this big like feeling of dread and like, oh, I'm going to have to go back to the U.S. My tail between my legs. Are, we're failures. Like this didn't work. How close are we to having to go back? But what we didn't realize at the time was that while it sucked that we were in that financial situation, it was an eye opener for us and that you don't have to have an office. You don't have to have a physical location. You can work in our business from anywhere. Now, if you're running an oil change company or like a small like franchise or something like locally in your city, well, yeah, you know, it requires your presence or someone's presence there. But with our business building and helping people, you know, broker the sale of online businesses, we don't have to be anywhere. So, you know, we started working from home and, you know, continued to, to hire people, started to grow that side of our business to the point where in 2014, my uh, now wife and I started traveling around. So we spent 2014 to 2019 living out of suitcase and spending time in Singapore, Manila, Bangkok, the US, Europe. And so, you know, we even today we spend half our time in Asia, half our time in the US. And so that's and that this doesn't apply to me as a founder and my business partner. Our entire company is completely location independent. So we've got Americans living in Medellin. We've got a British guy living in Prague. We've got people living wherever they want, whenever they want, as long as they can get their work done in the location they're in. That's great. So, you know, a failure, we're like, oh my God, we're shutting down this office and we're going to be working from home. What kind of losers are we turned into a real strength in that when we hire people, we tell them you can work from anywhere. We're not going to hold you to certain hours, certain time zones, but make sure you get your shit done. Yeah. And you know, let's, let's talk about that because you have built this multi-million dollar business with the remote team, right? Yeah. So, so how, how did you leverage remote team to help grow your business into a multi-million dollar company? Yeah. So um, there were some people doing it at that time in like the 2011, 2012 timeframe, but not a lot. I mean, it wasn't forced on us like it was during COVID during the pandemic and everything where like everyone kind of saw, oh, this is a way, new way of working. Yeah. Were, um, you, were you remote before COVID or did you switch because of COVID? Oh, we were already remote. We went remote in like 2011, 2012. So yeah, this is a long time ago. Um, in fact, COVID hurt us a little bit on the hiring side because we had this unique value proposition where we were like, hey, you uh, know, yeah. we would bring people out like a new hires, particularly early on, we were getting our first kind of Western hires. We would bring people out to the Philippines. They would live with us or near us for three to six months before they became like fully location independent. So we had this cool value proposition of like, look, make dollars, spend pesos or bot or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and you can live quite well, right? But then when the pandemic hit, it was like, well, our hiring proposition of being able to live and work from anywhere was like, well, everyone does that. You know what I mean? I got all these crazy you know, additional health benefits of 401k from this other company. We were like, God, that hurts us a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't as helpful. But yeah, we were doing this way before anyone. And and what we what was helpful for us is we, we figured out that like by measuring outputs um, by individuals and by the departments instead of inputs, that was super helpful because we could just measure the 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 uh, the quality of the work they were doing, the total outputs they were doing. Now, if there was a problem with a, a team or an individual, well, then we can start looking on in the inputs. We can back out a little bit and say, okay, what what 
what are the hours you're putting in? How many of these things are you doing per day or per week, per month? And that was helpful in like kind of solving problems where we saw issues with the outputs. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because, you know, one of the things you mentioned, you, you said COVID, the pandemic, it was a very difficult time for your team because of recruiting, yet you still were able to scale this business into a multi-million dollar business during the pandemic. Yeah. How yeah. So grow, how do you do that? <laughs> so it was a double-edged sword. So when I, when I mentioned we, it was a more challenging time to hire, mm. uh, that's only because our business was growing so quickly. So it was, it was this unique thing where like, you know, it's like one of those like high class problems to have. Whereas like, oh, we need more people. And so, you know, one of the things is, you know, because we broker the sale of internet companies or online businesses, you know, the pandemic really opened people's eyes to like, you know, why am I going in this office every day, living in this high cost of living city um, just for this paycheck? I'd rather go build my own business or buy a business that I can run from the beach in Bali. You know what I mean? And so there's this real push toward like looking at online businesses to purchase, um, you know, working remotely. And so we started selling a lot more businesses. We had our best year ever in 2021. It declined a bit. We had this, we had a COVID peak. So while everyone, like everyone else's businesses were struggling and, and it was a difficult time, ours was gangbusters. So it was a really weird time. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that was a real push in 2020 and 2021 in terms of growth for our company. You know, one of the things you mentioned too, is when you kind of started this out, you, you went from corporate, you know, to the Philippines and, and you started this, how did you fund it? Did you just go, you know, bootstrapped it or did you get some venture backing funding? Yeah, fully bootstrapped. So we built the business from scratch. And so that's why it took a, a quite a bit longer. I'm a big believer in bootstrapping. I, I think I prefer it uh, between raising venture. Um, one of the benefits of bootstrapping is that you're not forced to grow where you have investors breathing down your neck to take a, you know, a 5% chance at a 100x exit, right, or whatever, which is good odds, like you should probably take that bet. But I don't want to risk the farm. We, Joe and I, my business partner, didn't want to risk the farm on this company we put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into. And so we were able to grow it a bit more cautiously than yeah. investors might require. Now, event that, you know, I think that was, it felt right and was a good move at the time. But there are businesses that require like larger amounts of capital to get started. So um, either in very fast growing industries where you're competing with people like at a very high level um, uh, in situations where there's a, just a ton of uh, infrastructure that needs to be built up or a lot of research uh, behind a lot in the medical field, for example. So we weren't in that boat and didn't require the investment, which was uh, helpful. Yeah, you know, and I think that's a, you know, you brought up a very, very valid point. Um, a lot of, you know, the folks that are interested in entrepreneurship, uh, I, I don't mean this in a malice way against venture capitalists, but their goal is to make money. Uh, and so when you're, when they're going in and they're helping you uh, financing, their end goal is to get recoup that money back as quickly as possible. Um, whether that was aligned with your goals or not makes a little difference uh, sometimes to them. Their goal is to kind of finalize that deal and get that funding back, right? Because that's that's added to their risks uh, and, and they were trying to close those risks as soon as possible. So again, you know, to each their own, everybody should go down every route they want to explore, but just be mindful when you're going down that venture capital route, uh, making sure that the venture capitalists you are working with their goals align with your goals because yeah. at the end of the day, they're they're usually not just uh, investing um, in you as an individual, but they're also investing in your brand, your operations, right? Uh, if they see something of value within the organization that they can improve, like Justin mentioned, and you can come on the website and just put a little tweaks here or help a little operational support here, and now you got a you know a viable multi million dollar revenue business. Uh, if they're able to see that, they'll do it. But again, sometimes it comes at the cost of the the entrepreneurs own kind of mission and driven and values. Well, well that, that's true for raising investment and working with like VC funds or private equity groups, whatever. It's also very much true for selling your business, maybe a little less so, but there's, uh, because we saw a lot of online businesses and depending on the business, you're going to have some involvement in the transition of the business. Potentially they're going to hold you on uh, because you're going to retain seller equity and they're going to need you in an advisory or an employee position, um, or just to help them reach earnout targets so you can get the rest of your money out or whatever of the business. So, you know, they're, you're, you're going to work with this investor or buyer. So you need to make sure that you're 
vibing as the, as the kids say today uh but like you need to make sure it's cool right that they, yeah. you agree with their mission that you think their their strategy sound like they're, it's important and even if even if it's an all cash offer there's gonna be at least a couple of months typically a couple of months transition where you're gonna want to make sure that you guys are on the same page so yeah yeah very 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 good point you know you know starting your business obviously has its rewarding moments what are some aspects that you found relatively easy or enjoyable during the early stages of your entrepreneurial journey? I liked uh, building an audience, right? Uh, building traction. We, we'd, uh, you know, Joe and I had always kind of operated in business, um, which is wrong, but this is how we thought. It was like, look, you know, <laughs> if you find something that works, that makes money, shut your mouth, make your money, don't tell anyone about it. Like just kind of like, keep it quiet, keep it silent, you know, non, not really transparent about it at all. And we had an opportunity with Empire Flippers because it was kind of like a side gig, something we were trying out. It was more of a, a, a trial of something than like everything, you know, of ours in the, in, initially, because we saw our outsourcing company that was kind of making the main money, making our, you know, paying our bills. And so we were able to like try something. And what we were able to do is like, we had this way of building sites that was profitable instead of just shutting our mouths and building them, you know, we said, look, why don't we just talk about it very publicly? Uh, we're not going to hide it behind a paywall. We're not going to charge people for the information in an ebook or a course or whatever. We're just going to lay it all out there. Here's how we do our keyword research. Here's how we build our websites. Here's how we monetize them, everything. And, you know, 90% of the audience, they're not going to buy websites from us, but 10% will. And so the more we build that audience, the more buyers were ultimately going to build for our, what became our marketplace. Now, the cool thing about that is the 90% didn't buy from us, but they were following our process and, you know, uh, shouting to the rooftops about this is cool. These guys are onto something. And so they'd help promote our brand you know, through word of mouth without our doing anything. And so, you know, we end up meeting a bunch of uh, future partners out of that kind of content, whether it's through our podcast or our blog. And we talked about failures we had where we got sued, where we got scammed. We talk very openly and honestly about these things in our business. And it really resonated with people. They were like, damn, you know, that's real. Like I've gone through that or I've been through a situation like that. And that's the shit you don't talk about is the stuff people want to hear. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's true. In fact, let's, that's a great point and kind of leads me to my next question. You know, entrepreneurship comes with its fair share of challenges. What are some of the, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in your entrepreneurship uh, kind of profession? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch. You know, I mentioned shutting down the office was pretty terrible. Yeah. One of, one of the things we dealt with more recently was uh, Joe and I had gone through the process of potentially selling a portion of our company, right? It was a little less than 50%. And we were deep into it, nine, 10 months. And, you know, even though we advised people on selling their business, we used advisors ourselves and we were you know, in the process, met with their management and the private equity groups multiple times with our whole management team, kind of, you know, everyone's remote. So we had to fly them all into the US oh, wow. a couple of times and, and put everything together. It was a real hassle. And we got toward the end and the deal didn't happen. And this was um, January, 2022. And we'd been through a nine month process. We were, you know, a couple of weeks away from, uh, you know, finalizing the APA and getting everything done. And they bailed smartly, I'd add, because our business declined after that. But so a smart move on their part, but horribly devastating for my business partner and I. I mean, just put us in such a funk. And so we had a problem where we were rudderless we were captainless and we kind of like pulled back from the business to some degree. We'd already pulled back a bit over the years, but pulled back even more. And so we left this situation where our management team was kind of like vying for leadership and we weren't kind of like filling the leadership role and they were frustrated with us about that. And they were kind of competing against each other because we were like, you know, we don't know what, what's going to happen. And so uh, this is kind of a very specific problem, but you know, us kind of have going through that funk and leaving our business kind of rudderless left us in a position where our managers were competing against each other and working my business partner and I to see who would kind of come out on top and run stuff. And that, that until we figured that out, it took months in our funk to kind of like come out of it and say, hey, it's us, my business partner and I are screwing this up. They're doing everything they're supposed to do. They're trying to run the business and make everything happen and like get us back on track and we're screwing shit up. So we had to like grab each other and say, Hey man, we got to get back into this. we got to figure out how we're going to run this going forward because this isn't working. So that was, that was, that was, uh, that happened uh, last year, 2023. And you know, I gotta say that's one that having that 
insight and in, into understanding like you know what shit we're screwing up we got our I got our staff over here busting their ass and we're over here screwing around it's us that needs to fix it and i sometimes i think you know from the entrepreneurship world that is a very difficult thing to say right to, because in the entrepreneurship world we're always the best we'd wanted to we always want to succeed and we're always moving forward however we do have our funks we do have those moments how I, I do think you guys get out of that how do you get out of the funk yeah i, th I think it's helpful so i, I try to I don't always do this, but I try to take the philosophy of like, you know, when, it, when something's going badly or when there's a problem, like ultimately Joe and I are responsible for that. Right. right. And, yeah. and if I try to do it, it's me that's responsible for that. <laughs> and even, even things that are, that are outside of our control. And there are things that happen outside of your control, right? There's market yeah. conditions, whatever. The pandemic. Yeah. 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 Right. If I still try to look at that, okay. Okay. Well, yes, the pandemic happened, but what was my or our response to it? Like, how could we have handled that better? How could we have done better there? And so also on the flip side of that too, when things are going well, I pat myself on the back a little bit, take a little bit of pride in that, but also realize that there's a lot of luck going on, right? And so, you know, people ask, well, how did you do this? And can people recreate the process? I'm like, well, yes, we worked hard and these are the things we did and it worked for us, but it's not guaranteed to work for you, right? So we got lucky because we took a lot of shots at it, right? And we continue, put our head down, got through the dip. But it doesn't, you know, there are people that try to do that and don't, it doesn't work for them. So I try to take too much credit when things go well and try to take all the responsibility when things go bad. And I don't always do that right. And I, I don't always um, accomplish that, but that's that's where I try to come at it from. And it, I think it makes you really look at kind of like where you could have done better and not be too high on your horse when things are going well. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? You're kind of talking, you have this moment where you guys are down on your luck. You guys are, you know, the business is kind of flailing in a way. How did you rebuild the brand? Yeah, it was difficult. So what we realized is, is uh, you know, we have a management team that's done a really good job of kind of running our business for the last couple of years. I mean, Joe and I are involved like from an advisory perspective, but on the day to day, we're not there. So uh, we effectively picked someone, it's Andy Alloway, to run Empire Flippers. He runs it internally, does all the weekly meetings with everyone. And seemed like a great pick. And and Joe and I, when we run into like stalemates as a business partnership, by putting Andy in charge, he can really kind of navigate a smaller ship because we were, you know, in 2021, we were larger than we are today. And so we kind of went from going to be a much larger HR corporate company to a smaller, more um, uh, nimble ship. And so we need one person that can kind of more quickly make decisions that can turn us around faster. And so that's kind of what we chose and we still are able to advise him. What's a challenge now is determining like, when do we step in with Andy and say, no, 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 I don't think you should do this. Um, here's our reasons why toward letting him have enough rope, right? And so those are new challenges and like, how do you advise on a business versus running it? And um, I don't have that figured out. Honestly, we're, we're, that's, that's something we're going through now. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of where we are now with empire flippers on the flip side, you know, we have another company. Let me, let me explain. Yeah. Part of like brokering, uh, internet businesses is that there's a limit to how many people, um, have the time or the skills to buy an online business, right? Like a number of years ago, my aunt came to me and said, Hey, I love what you're doing. You know, I've got money put away. I'd like to buy an online business that I can tinker with that I can work with. But she has no internet business skills, right? She doesn't know domain hosting. She doesn't know anything about it. And I'm like, sorry, I like you just need to go to these sites. I send them elsewhere to go learn, right? Send her, you know, go to learn over your niche pursuit, smart passive income, whatever, and then come back to me and you got the skills. But that's kind of crappy because we're sending people with money and an interest in investing away. So we're like, what can we do about this? I mean, because there's a limited amount of people that have the skills to buy a business that's growing. Um, but it's not very wide. And so we end up creating a company called webstreet.co. So it basically, it, it's, it's another marketplace, but it pairs investors, uh, people looking for passive investments with all these experienced operators. You know, over the decade, more than a decade we've been doing this, we have all these people that have successfully run businesses, sold businesses, bought businesses, grown businesses. We have this unique uh, network of operators. We're like, look, what if we can pair the investors with the operators? Operators put up some of their cash, and then investors put in the rest to make it a passive investment for them, give them quarterly distributions. So we've done that since over the last three years, and we've raised um, right around $33 million um, for a number of operators. They've acquired about 40 assets or so. And so we run them a portfolio. So that's kind of uh, you know how we went from Empire Flippers with, I think, you know, kind of a small, there's a limited amount of buying pool 
to Web Street where we can match a, a ton of uh, investors that, you know, capital is looking for yield, right? So right. there's a ton yep. of that with a, 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 a number of uh, operators that is limited. And that's kind of our value on that side of things is we've got a bunch of operators. We've got a nice pool to pick from in terms of people that are experienced. Nice. You know, and I think that's, that's it's interesting because, you know, you you really kind of used a lot of your old expertise and experience to kind of create all of this, uh, you know, Empire Flippers and, and now you're almost like a holding company, right? Uh, which is really, really cool because I think that's exactly where I kind of see envision, you know, long term, right? Now, what with all of this, you know, insight and experience, you know, what valuable experience with your own valuable experience, what advice would you give, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs that are thinking of jumping into the entrepreneurial, you know, deep end, so to speak? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it, particularly if you're young, um, I think it changes as you get older, have children, get, you know, get married, have children, have other responsibilities. But if you're in your 20s, even early 30s, be super bold, be bold, right? Everyone, you know, you kind of have this um, kind of career path or even an entrepreneurial path that you think is kind of laid out. Like you have to start here and then you go here and then you can level up and finally you can just take podcasting, for example. You're like, look, maybe I'll start off with like the smaller guys and then I can work my way up to the guys with the bigger audience and then I'll approve myself. You know, Burger King, I'll work in the fries and then you could work yeah. at anything. Um, and there's no path. There's no requirement that you start off as the fry guy or you start off with the small entrepreneur. I mean, reach, reach, right? So I mean, maybe you're not going to get Elon Musk that first time. You might get someone else. Maybe you can get Seth Godin. Maybe you can get other like crazy, like well-known entrepreneurs on your first podcast if you really take a stab at it. So I'd say particularly if you're young, um, uh, take a stab. I'd also say it, it is, and this is from personal experience, it's really nice to uh, make dollars and spend pesos or whatever. So I know a lot of entrepreneurs, I, I've traveled a lot over the last 10 years. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in places like Chiang Mai, Thailand, right, which is the north of Thailand, the weather's decent, the, better than Bangkok. And there's just a ton of entrepreneurs up there hustling, right? And they're paying not much money. They put, you know, three, 400 bucks a month for a cool little apartment. They're, you know, eating $5 meals and $3 meals. And you know, they got a maid that cleans their place for $10 a week or whatever. You know, you go over there with 15, 20, $30,000 and you got way more runway than you would in San Francisco yep. or even places like Austin. So, I mean, you can go over there with $25,000 and have a year, year and a half of runway, right? Which, which gives you 12 to 18 months to figure shit out and try to make it work. Now you got to hustle. You can't go over there and just hang out and, you know, eat pad thai all day, but it gives you an opportunity if you really want to be an entrepreneur to like get more runway than you would have otherwise. Yeah. And in fact, folks, if you have not had the opportunity to visit Thailand and visit Chiang Mai, I highly recommend it. The blue moon party is something you should definitely do once in your life. That is the new year's party there. And it is phenomenal. And I also want to apologize for folks listening. I said younger earlier. I meant anybody under the age of a hundred is in my fact, younger to me. So, so please don't, don't scaffold me or uh, scold me online for saying younger. Cause again, all anybody can be an entrepreneur at any age. You can step into and start doing this business. Uh, and I really like Justin's advice, you know, be bold, no matter what it is you do uh, try to be bold and doing it because again innovative and in, in the thoughts uh you know i think i talked about this on a previous episode is you know we're always taught at a very young age to stop stop imagining you know stop being stop drawing stop you know getting your head out of the clouds kind of thing and i would encourage you to keep keeping your head in the clouds keep innovating keep imagining keep trying to do things differently because uh you know there's like like justin said you know one thing led to another which led to another and, and it just continues to spiral in different things but it's all because he took the time and said you know what let me think about this. Oh, wait, this is an op opportunity right here that we can explore, uh, you know, and, and also failing. Failing is part of that journey as well, but don't get stuck up on the failing. Like Justin mentioned, you know, sometimes you're going to hit, you're going to hit a, a rock bottom, but there's also people around you that are going to be there to help you bring you up. You know, it's usually your partners, your friends, your colleagues, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts and ideas is always important as Justin was also mentioning, you know, making sure you're, you know, previously I was, I would agree back in the day, it was like, Oh no, this is my thought. And this is my idea. So on, I can't share my thought and my entrepreneurial thought idea with anybody because they're going to go steal it. They're going to go make the business. And guess what folks, nobody's going to steal your thoughts or business because it's really expensive to start a business. And if you have the passion for it, nobody will do it better than you.
Truth. Yeah, that's always cute. You know, someone's just starting off when they're like, you know, I've got this idea, but I need you to sign an NDA or I need this. I need these protections in place before I even talk to you about it. I mean, it's like, oh, I, I know where you're at. Like you're yep. just you're, you're early stage or just you're you're thinking you got this crazy idea and you don't want to share with anyone when really that the, you know, they think that golden goose is the idea. Uh, that's not true, though. Right. The idea is the egg. Right. The idea creation, the execution. That's your golden goose. That's what's going to keep delivering golden egg after golden egg. Very true. Now, so Justin, what's next? What's next for Empire Flippers and what's next for Justin Cook? Yeah, so we're growing. We continue to grow Empire Flippers. Uh, we're currently raising another round for Web Street. Um, we're going to continue to grow both those businesses. We're always looking at new ideas. I think um, finances is is, uh, is of interest. I think you know additional finance for buying online businesses will help to raise multiples for sellers. Uh, we'll have to get more deals done and provide more liquidity to the market. So I think that'd be really helpful. We're looking at ways to do that. Personally, I want to get back to doing what you're doing. I used to run a podcast and I loved it, man. I love talking to cool entrepreneurs and having a good time. I love like getting better at asking questions. And I feel like um, there's, it's pretty saturated, but I think, I think I have some interesting things to say and some interesting things to like ask entrepreneurs that, uh, that would provide some value to the market. So I'm working on a, working on a podcast right now that, Hopefully I'll have out in a few months. I love it. In fact, folks, this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter where this information will be. You can visit the shadesofe.com to subscribe to the newsletter. I'll have Justin's information. We'll also have information about Empire Flippers. And Justin, please let me know when that podcast airs. I'm happy to make sure uh, post it and kind of let the folks know, the audience know that it's available. Now, Justin, before we go, how can the audience get a hold of you? If they're, Empire, uh, if they're interested in Empire Flippers, maybe they're interested in getting in contact with you directly how can they contact you yeah if you want to buy you know, businesses or potentially sell your business take a look at empireflippers.com we got a bunch of listings there it's also really good for like aspirationally to kind of see kind of what's out there and what businesses are going for if you're looking for passive investment and you're looking for cash flow or you want to be an operator you've got some experience running online businesses and you want help like raising money from investors go over to webstreet.co webstreet.co and uh, you can fill out the information there take a look Perfect. And again, folks, visit the shades of e.com and subscribe to the newsletter because this information will be on that. Justin, thank you again so much for joining the show. I really do appreciate it. Really cool what you guys are doing. I think, uh, again, uh, finding value in a web page and being able to flip it and sell it is just, it's really fascinating to me. And, and it is a truly, I know a couple of people that have done it in the past and a very lucrative thing to do as well. So, uh, you know, congratulations on all your guys' success. Uh, if I go out to Thailand again, I'll definitely let you know because, man, I do love visiting Chiang Mai. Or where, where you, you're at, actually, uh, you're currently down in uh, Texas, correct? Yeah, I'm in Houston. I'm going to be here till probably July or so of these, this year, and then I'll head over to Asia, do some like Manila, probably Bangkok. Um, my wife's from the Philippines, so we'll visit some family over there. My business partner's in Manila. He's based there, so I'll hang nice. out over there for a bit. Nice. I'll be in London, Greece, and London, Greece, and Paris, and Long beach this summer this june so june don't call me in june folks i'm out of here you're out <laughs> well thanks gabriel so much and thanks for shades of entrepreneurship i think it's a great uh great community great channel thanks buddy yes no for those listening again uh, please subscribe at the shades of e.com you can also find us on the social sites linkedin facebook uh, twick talk and youtube so again you can subscribe to our youtube channel and if you so choose you can join us on patreon for five dollars a month receive these episodes a week early as well as the issue of the book and some other valuable tips thank you again and have a great night